Let us pray. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, it is now. If ever we love you, Lord Jesus, it is now. And so we ask you, mighty God, to let your Holy Spirit now come amongst us and upon us in a special way that your word will be interpreted with accuracy, with precision, with power, and with grace. That each of us will hear what your spirit is saying to us. And that each of us will be given the help of the Holy Spirit to respond to you with our whole heart. So let the words of my mouth and the reflections of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. The people of God say, Amen. Brothers, sisters, I want to lift up for us the reading from the Gospel according to St. John chapter 15. And here again, verse 14. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, you are my friends. In our day, the understanding of friendship is changing. Jesus did not have Facebook, and Twitter, and Instagram. And I could have only imagined Jesus' friend list if he had such accounts. People who have absolutely no intention of following him or giving their lives to him would send him friend request. Many of us have thousands of friends on our various social media platforms or pages. But yet, many of us have few people that we can truly call friend. So in spite of the fact that some people have thousands of friends, and whenever they post something, whatever it is, they get thousands of likes. Yet many of these same people are alone, lonely, and miserable. During the day, they can be chatting with thousands of people they have never met, will never meet, they have no interest in, and who have absolutely no interest in them. And when the lights go off, they're all alone, and they're miserable. They hate their lives. They're lonely, and they long for friendship and for intimacy. Jesus says of his disciples, you are my friends. He says, I will no longer call you servants, but friends, because whatever I hear from the Father, I tell you. Therefore, you are my friends. There are quite a number of hymns that pick up this theme of God's friendship, Jesus' friendship. The hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, is an all-time favorite. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Another hymn writer says, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. 
Another one says, I have found a friend, oh, such a friend. He loved me ere I knew him. Yet another says, I have found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. But what about the song that says, there is not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend is like Jesus. Jesus called his disciples friends. It is interesting for us to note, my brothers and sisters, that this declaration of them being his friends came after some three years of continuous journeying with them. Jesus did not call them friends on the same day that he called them to be his disciples. This happened some three years later. No doubt Jesus and these disciples would have gone through varied and diverse experiences. Jesus would have gotten to know them better, trust them more fully. Jesus would have seen their strengths and their weaknesses. Jesus had enough time to reveal himself to them. Notice that Jesus doesn't call everyone a friend. In this particular passage, this reference is to the disciples, those who are closest to him. Jesus called them friends after he knew everything that they were to know about them, the good and the bad, the strengths and the weaknesses, and yet he called them friends. I believe, my brothers and sisters, that in a similar way, Jesus wants to call us his friends. As a matter of fact, I want to submit to you that Jesus invites you to be a friend of his. Jesus sends you a friend request today. And he invites you to be his friend, not just from a distance, not just on a social media page. Jesus wants you to be his real friend, his intimate friend who will get to know him in all his fullness. And he wants to get to know you just as you are, without any pretense, without any mask. He wants to know everything about you so that you can become his friend and his companion. It is also important for us to note that this friendship is not for us to initiate, but it is Jesus who initiates this friendship. This friendship is as a result of divine intervention, divine purpose. Divine initiative. It is Jesus who takes the steps necessary to become friends with his disciples. It is Jesus who calls them friends. In a similar way, I want us to know today that Jesus initiates this friendship with you. Jesus takes the divine initiative and invites you not just to be a disciple, not just to be one of his followers, but Jesus invites you to become a friend, to become his personal friend. Notice that it is important for us to note that we cannot win our way 
into Jesus' friendship. That we cannot make ourselves good enough to become friends of Jesus. That we cannot work our way into his favor. Notice that Jesus invites us to this friendship. Not because we have done so well. Not because we are good enough. Not because we have overcome the obstacles and challenges of life. As a matter of fact, Jesus knows all of our bad ways. He knows our messed up lives. Jesus knows all our sins. Jesus knows all of our faults. And yet Jesus invites us into his confidence. Yet Jesus invites us into an intimate relationship. Jesus invites us into a friendship with him. In spite of all that he knows of us and about us, he invites us to be his friends. He invites us into his confidence. Jesus knew these disciples. Jesus knew what they were capable of. Jesus knew that they had a way of dividing each other and fight for power and prestige. Jesus knew that they had a conversation about which one will be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus doesn't single out anyone. But he says, you, plural, are my friends. Jesus knew what was going to happen a few days from when he made this declaration. He knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that Peter would deny him. He knew that all of the others would desert him. And yet Jesus says, you are my friends. And Jesus makes this declaration. Not only based on what he knew about them. But also because he knew the possibilities. He knew what they could become. And so he says, if you keep my commandments. You are my friends, brothers and sisters, today, Jesus invites you into his confidence. Jesus invites you to be a friend, not just a follower, not just a disciple, not just a servant, but a friend. Because Jesus knows quite well that many of us can become his servants, his followers, and his disciples, but not his friends. Jesus knows quite well that many of us can do many things for him that are good. Jesus knows that many of us can immerse ourselves in his service and do the best work possible. But he knows at the same time that while we are doing that, that we can avoid the intimacy that he has called us to by spending quality time with him, by having deep conversations with him. He knows that we can do all of these things for him, but yet we do not bear our hearts. We are not transparent with him that we hold back many aspects of our lives. Wasn't that the reality? In the house of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, when Jesus and his disciples had gone to their home and a meal was being prepared for Jesus, Martha was working hard in the kitchen preparing a meal. She was serving him. Mary, on the other hand, was at his feet. Martha, you know the story, complained to Jesus about Mary's position and disposition. 
Jesus said, Martha, you're worried about many things, but your sister Mary has chosen the better path. Mary proved herself on that day and that occasion, not only to be a servant of Jesus, but a friend, because a friend of Jesus sits at his feet. May I submit to you, therefore, that you are no friend of Jesus if you do not spend quality time in conversation with him in prayer. I submit to you that you are no friend of Jesus if you do not spend time in his word. I tell you that you are no friend of Jesus if you are always rushing off to be about your own business or somebody else's business. And therefore you cut your time of prayer and reflection and Bible reading. You're no friend of Jesus. If the first thing that greets you in the morning is your social media page, checking to see what others want you to know and spend no time with Jesus. You're no friend of Jesus if the last person you speak to at night is someone on your social media page or someone else on the telephone or someone else somewhere. A friend of Jesus is one who stays near. And the reason why Jesus says to them, you are my friends, is because Jesus is calling them to be with him to enjoy his presence, to spend time with him. It's interesting that this is coming just after the earlier part of Mark's, of John's gospel, chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches and my father is the gardener. And Jesus then invites them and says, come, abide in me, remain in me. Stay in me, be connected to me. It is out of that discourse that Jesus says, I call you friends. Brothers and sisters, Jesus invites you to be a friend. And don't get beside yourself. Don't ever think that you are called to be a friend because you have lived well. Don't get beside yourself and think that you're called to be a friend because you have served well, because you have done this or you have done that. No, long before you have done any such thing, he knew you and called you to be his friend. It is no wonder John also tells us, for God so loved the world. That even when the world was sinking in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more, the master of the sea heard a despairing cry. From the waters lifted us. It is that which John is speaking to, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus calls you to be his friends because he takes the divine initiative. It is not you who have chosen him, but he has chosen you and invites you into his confidence. That's how much Jesus loves you. Have you betrayed this friendship? Have you denied this friendship? Have you walked away from this friendship? Without this friendship, your life is empty. It doesn't matter how much church you have and how much church you go to, without this friendship, your life will be empty. Without this friendship, it doesn't matter how much of this world's goods you have, it will all be for north, unless you become 
and accept the invitation to the friendship that Jesus offers. What I also want to say about this friendship is that Jesus says, as the Father reveals stuff to me, I tell them to you. Wow, this is, this is important. Because a friend of Jesus is in the know. A friend of Jesus is in the know. Not to become busybodies, but to know how to serve. Not to become gossipers, but to know how to pray. Friends of Jesus are never in the dark. They are never at a loss. They understand what the Father is doing because everything that the Father reveals to Jesus, Jesus reveals to his friends. It is no wonder that John on the Isle of Patmos imprisoned for his faith, banished on an island, removed from his earthly friends, that because John was a friend of Jesus, Jesus met him on the Isle of Patmos. But Jesus did more than that. Jesus revealed to him the secrets of the kingdom. Jesus told him things that were not known by other human beings. Jesus revealed to him things that were not yet. Things that were still to be revealed. Things that were still to come to pass. Some of the things that Jesus revealed to his friend has not yet come to pass. But he knew it long before anyone else knew it. And so I'm saying to you that if you're a friend of Jesus, he reveals to you the secrets of the kingdom. You are never in the dark. Nothing catches you off guard. Whatever the enemy is planning, he will reveal to you. Whatever is happening in the world, he will reveal to you. If you're a friend of Jesus, then you will know the secrets of the kingdom. And so John didn't they only heard about the things that were going to happen, but Jesus opened Open the veil into glory and John before he entered glory saw what glory is like before he entered into the real presence of God around the throne John saw into heaven and so John was asked who are these people where have they come from John says I don't know the angel of the Lord said John I'm going to reveal something to you these are they who have come through the great order deal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And now they are around the throne of God praising God night and day. John, around this throne, there is no night or day because the sun, S-O-N, is shining every day. John, the, the presence of the living God God is never so real as it is here. And John saw it. And so while John is enduring imprisonment and banishment, John can rejoice and worship because he's a friend of Jesus. And Jesus shows him that, John, what you are experiencing is not all there is. Open the veil and see, John. What awaits you? Whatever the Father reveals to Jesus, Jesus reveals to his friend. So you see, friends of Jesus do not stumble through life. That is why when you are a friend of Jesus, he reveals to you what others are plotting. 
And when you begin to pray and begin to dig up the fallow ground and begin to tear down the stronghold and everything that they plan come to north, they want to know how you know why he reveals to you the secrets of the kingdom. When the enemy and his cohorts are planning for the church to destroy the church, friends of God are on their knees interceding and God is revealing to them the things that they need to break down and tear down. And so because you're a friend of God, you're a friend of Jesus, the devil is going to be frustrated in attacking you because he reveals to you the secrets of the kingdom. But also Jesus goes on and he says to his friends, he says, love one another as I have loved you. You see, if you are my friends, the love that the Father has for me, the love that I've shared with the Godhead, the love that we have shared in Trinity, in relationship with each other. It is this love that I am drawing you into. And so the love that I have experienced from the Father and the love that I have for the Father is the same love that I have loved you with. Hear Jesus now. Therefore, love one another with this same love. Notice that Jesus is not saying because this love of God, this, this love of Jesus for his friends, is not the love that requires it to be reciprocated. It is not the kind of love that loves those who love. But it is the kind of love that loves everyone, including those who hate you including those who despitefully use you and persecute you, including those who speak ill of you, including those who set traps for you. Jesus is saying that you can love them because I am your friend and you now have access to the love of God that has loved me and the love that I have loved the Father with, you now need to love one another. And so Jesus is saying, because we are his friends, we are invited to allow the love of God to so fill us and then to begin to flow over into the love, lives of others. I therefore submit to you that friends of God are people who have much love to offer. Friends of Jesus are not revengeful. Friends of Jesus are not haters. Friends of Jesus are not cruel. Friends of Jesus are not nasty. Friends of Jesus do not wish evil for others. Friends of Jesus do not push people down. Friends of Jesus lift others. Friends of Jesus surround others with love. Friends of Jesus are patient in love. According to Paul in Romans, in, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is patient. Friends of Jesus are patient with others. Take time with others. They do not render evil for evil, but render good when evil is meted out to them. And so he says, Come be my friends, so that the world may know Jesus by your love. Let me say finally, that friends of Jesus produce fruits that last. 
friends of Jesus, produce fruits that last. So Jesus invites them to produce fruits that last. Note it's not just to produce fruits, but to produce fruits that last. Not just fruits that are here today and gone tomorrow. Not just fruits for one's own personal consumption. Not just fruits for one's own generation. But fruits that will last. It is no wonder that Jesus, as he was ready to leave this earth in his physical form, said to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus was saying to them, Go and produce fruit that will last. Go and produce fruits in the lives of other people. Work the work to which I have called you in such a way that you are making an impact on the lives of others and the world in which you live. But ensure that this work is so deep, so effective, that this work will outlast you. That this work will benefit others who are not yet. That this work will be beneficial to generations not yet born. So let me bring it home. The fruit that Jesus is inviting us here at James Street to produce should be of such that long after we are gone, Long after we are brought back to this church being carried in a box uh, and when we make our final exit being carried out, long after that, uh, the fruits of our lives uh, must continue to bless generations thereafter. I am submitting to us today that persons like Sarah Ann Gill produce fruits that have lasted and will continue to last. It is because of the fruits that she produced that we are the beneficiaries, not just in the Methodist Church, but the religious landscape of Barbados and the region are beneficiaries of her fruits. Because she toiled and labored and worked in her time, not just for herself, not just for the few persons who are part of her class, not just for a congregation, but for an entire nation hundreds of years later. That's what Jesus is pointing to about fruit that lasts. We must produce fruit that lasts. In other words, we must think about the work of God. We must think about the church of Jesus Christ when we are no longer a part of the church militant. That when we are a part of the church triumphant, the church in heaven, that our work that we are left behind must be of such that it continues to inspire people. It continues to bless people. It continues to provide a platform on which others will build their faith and their lives. And I believe that that is what Jesus meant when he says, even though they die, yet shall they live. Because even though we die, our work will continue to live. And our name will continue to live. And people will continue to keep us alive. Because our fruits endures many generations. The question therefore is, is your work of any significance that it will produce fruits? that will last? What are you making of your grandchildren? 
What are you making of your neighbor's children? What are we making of the children entrusted to us in this church, in this Sunday school? Are we producing fruit that will last? Let me say to us that if the fruits are going to last, the fruits can't just be lip service. The fruit must be the very fruits that we carry in our own lives that are being emulated by others. We can't teach what we don't live. We can't nurture in others what has not been nurtured in us. We can facilitate in others what we refuse to submit ourselves to. We can tell people to love the Lord with all their heart when we only give a piece of our hearts. We get to produce fruit, my brothers and sisters, that lasts. And so I challenge you today, even as I challenge myself. You, even you. Yes, you. Jesus invites you to be a friend. He invites you into his confidence. He invites you into his personal space. He invites you to tabernacle with him. He invites you to abide in him. He invites you into a personal walk so that wherever you go, you carry Jesus with you. That wherever you stay, Jesus is with you. That Jesus becomes your all in all. That Jesus becomes your life, your faith, your hopes, your all. If you venture to live life without such a friend, life will eventually self-destruct. For he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life.